So welcome back to Sound Bites, the show about good people doing good things in the food and drink industry. And one of those people that's been doing it for a while and his family for a long while is Hugh Hamilton of Hugh Hamilton Wines. So welcome, Hugh. Thank you very much, Mark. Good to be here. Great. So, you know, <laughs> I Hugh's Wines used to be in our market uh, at Bishop Cellar, but... Uh, you know, so it's great to see that you're back here. We're hopefully, we'll see them wines in the market again. But tell us a little bit about the history of the wine, because it does. You say it dates back a few years. It does, Mark. Yeah, it dates back to um, 1837, when um, my forebears, my great 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 grandfather, left uh, England as it was then, and came out to Australia to or to South Australia, which was settled in 1836 as a as a free settled state. Um, it was a privatised colony, in other words, yeah. and they bought land sight unseen um, in England. Uh, they got, uh, for 80 pounds, you, you got a section plus a town acre. Came out, and they came out to South Australia. And then he had the some, idea of getting some vines there. Well, he came with a drinking habit, <laughs> a, wine, a wine drinking culture, you know, because he, he lived in Dover which is not, was not yep. far from France. Yep, sure. And there was a big influence of wine coming across the uh, English Channel. So, um, and there was no wine in, in South Australia. And so he bought some grapevines over from South Africa. Yeah, so what, and what did he bring? He bought um, Shiraz, Grenache and Pedro, which is a white, white variety, a, a Spanish variety. And, um, and, he, and he planted them in South Australia in 1838. And, um, had his first vintage in 1841 and reported to the South Australian government that he had produced 600 gallons, imperial gallons of wine, which is much more than a family can drink. Wow. And <laughs> so he sold it to his neighbours. And then, and the, and the business expanded and expanded over the generations. The business expanded right through to the 1970s uh, when it was sold out and we all split and, um, and set up on our own and, um, and yeah. the Hamilton family have made wine in South Australia continuously. There's never been a year without a Hamilton wine um, since for 185 years. Amazing. And you're referenced as the black sheep of the family, so I, I wore all black in your honour today. You, you have indeed, you have indeed, and I, I suspect there's something in your family too, you see, so... Um, well, that's you know, I've, definitely I've got, enjoyment of wine in my family, but... Yeah. I've got a line that says every family has one, Mark. I, 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 I quite, quite possibly am it, but... Um, so tell us, uh, so what made you the, uh, the black sheep? What's the renegade in you? Well, it's, it's, it's a matter of context, and um, uh, when I set out on my own, because I, I left the family crew and uh, set out on my own, it made for some very interesting Christmases, you might say. Mm. So, um, so that's it sort of came out of okay. that. Really. Okay, yeah. and, the, and, and what's interesting too, now, now you've been on your own for, for a number of years, but you're not really technically running the company as much anymore. Well, there comes a time, Mark, where you have to let go, and um, I'm of a certain age. I've been around the block a few times, got yeah. quite a few miles on the clock, and um, uh, and I've got a daughter that's very, very capable, Mary Hamilton, and yeah. uh, and she's uh, she basically runs the business, I mean, and I just do as I'm told. Right, and 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 somehow you landed here in Halifax, uh, uh, going back probably to your uh, old relationship with John Stewart of Bishop Seller. <laughs> Yes, I've got um, in-depth relationships <laughs> in many parts of the world and, yeah. in, and including Nova Scotia. It's uh, um, being in the wine business, you meet some fascinating people in life and, uh, uh, and make friends all over the world. And um, one of the places I've made friends with is, um, is uh, people yeah. here in Nova Scotia. So, yeah, well, I mean, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm delighted to be back here. And uh, and I brought my wife with me. She she couldn't wait to get back here either. Yeah. And so you're you're hanging out in the Gaspro Valley, which is amazing, which is our wine country, and hopefully tasting a few sparkling wines and bubbles and other wines. Yes, I was here in the very early days of uh, of grape growing d down there and wine making down in the Gaspro oh, Valley. Yeah. So. Um, so it's you, good. To, it's good to go back, and I can see it's expanded dramatically. Yeah, a bit of an evolution since those years. Indeed. Um, so what I think is very interesting too is, I mean, you produce uh, Shiraz and Grenache-based wines in Australia and in the McLaren Vale, which is a, for those who don't know, is an interesting region of South Australia, which is a little bit more moderated than some of the the, the classic Clares and Barossas of the world. Uh, little, or certainly Barossa. 
Yeah, it's, um, it's located just south of the city of Adelaide, uh, uh, less than an hour south, and uh, it's very close to the coast. So it gets the influence, the maritime influence of the, of the sea there. Um, plus there's a, uh, the Mount Lofty Ranges are behind us, so it gets cool air dropping down from there at night. So the wines are uh, they're, they're atypical of what some people think is Australian red wine. Um, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of diversity there. Um, more soil types in McLaren Vale than any other region of the world, viticultural region. So yeah. it's uh, that's a statement. Knowing you know, like yeah. when South Africa has some pretty diverse yes, soil structure. it does. It uh, does indeed. But, um, and what I love about it is that you okay, you produce some classic varietals, but um, one that isn't Saparavi. So and those I've been around the Nova Scotia wine business long enough to remember that we had a lot of early winemaking with uh, a cross of Saparavi with uh, Vitus Amarensis called Saverni. And uh, uh, what it brought, decided in your brain that Saparavi was a grape you wanted to play with? Well, Mark, it's a little bit of a story and uh, I'll be brief about it. But um, back in the uh, 1990s, at the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, um, a, a gentleman brought his family out to uh, South Australia and he went to, to um, a college and had lessons on how to speak English as a second language. Mm. And my sister-in-law was um, teaching that. And she rang me up at about 10 o'clock one night and said, Hugh, I have a, uh, a, a guy here in my class who claims he's a winemaker from Georgia. Could you get him a job? And I said, Alison, I can't get myself a job. How am I going to get a communist winemaker a yep. job? Yep. Well, I said, I'll meet the guy. And I did meet him. And, uh, and when I met him, I was seriously impressed. I wondered why he was doing English as a second language, because his English wasn't very much different to mine. Um, and, um, and we just, we got talking and I did get him a job. Um, and he uh, talked to me about this unusual variety called Saparavi, which is one of the oldest grape varieties known to man. And it's different to most vinifera types. It is a vinifera um, um, uh, vine, but uh, it's a tenturier. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the it gives a lot of color. It Tent gives a lot of color. So the flesh is is red as well as the uh, as well as the skins. Whereas in the classic varieties like Grenache and Shiraz and Cabernet and Pinot, uh, that's all white, as you right. know. And uh, um, and I had a, just a little bit of land unplanted, just b about three rows equivalent in, in one particular block of mine. So I decided I would plant it. Had I done my homework, I wouldn't have planted it. Okay. And I didn't. He, um, he was uh, so enthusiastic about this that I got caught up in that enthusiasm. And I put it in. I've subsequently been to Georgia and I've seen where they grow it in Georgia and it is not at all like McLaren Vale, I can tell you. <laughs> because it's, it's grown on a plateau right. and you've got the Caucasus Mountains in the background with snow on them two months of the year. McLaren Vale, we're at sea level. We never get snow, we don't even get frost. And um, uh, anyway, I planted it and it has done extraordinarily well um, on my block of land. And um, so it's, uh, it's been an obsession of mine now for nearly you know, 25, has more, anybody, or more years, has your 30 years. Transferred to anybody else in the area, or are you the yes. exclusive? No, no, I'm not the exclusive. I was the exclusive. In fact, when I planted it, none of the other winemakers had even heard of it. And um, uh, yes, it has. There's there's more be, ha, that has been planted in McLarenville, and not just McLarenville in other areas. Even over in Victoria, it's planted there now, um, and even up as far as in Queensland, um, there's, wow. there's Saparavi, um, and there's. I think there's at least one vineyard in Western Australia and we run a Saparavi convention every two years and we bring all those people in down to McLaren Vale and we discuss it and you know all those idiosyncrasies of that variety. Amazing, yeah. amazing. So yeah, yeah something to look for. I mean I assume that's a pretty uh, in-demand wine. Amongst our, um, uh, our customers and we've got a very big personal following down there, they would walk over cut glass to get our oddball Saparavi, that's what okay. it's called. But after the first vintage, I always suspected it would be a great blending grape as well. And, but we never had enough of it to, to blend it. And it wasn't until 2010, uh, where we, well, I had a, a, a bit more acreage coming on um, in production. I was able to um, uh, allocate some literage to uh, doing a blend. It. And so I did some experiments on that. 
and we put, a, put out a product called Black Ops, which is a Shiraz Separavi. Last time I looked, it was the only blend of its type in the I'm world. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful wine. Well, yeah. I hope to get a black off sometime in my future. Or an oddball. Or an oddball, or yeah. uh, or actually was just happy enough to have some Jim Jim back here. So let's hope uh, it works out. And I want to thank you for your time talking to us, and uh, come visit uh, coming to visit our wine country. So it's always amazing to have winemakers from afar in our little neck of the wine world. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me on on your program. Thank you. Cheers. Sure.